In the last lecture, we defined a metric on the field of complex numbers. The metric was defined using uh, an absolute value, which was a natural extension of the notion of absolute value on the field of real numbers. The absolute value turned out to be the square root of the field norm. And we remarked that because of this, uh, it doesn't matter which copy of the complex field that we work on. The analysis will be consistent. Let's start by recalling the uh, metric that we defined. Recall that the metric defined on C is given by D of Z comma W is defined to be the absolute value of Z minus W for Z and W in C. So in this lecture, we will do a quick recap of uh, the familiar topological notions on the complex plane. Uh, this is uh, the material will be something which you would have already seen in a multivariate real analysis course. Nevertheless, let's do a quick re recap. The intention is also to set the notations for the rest of this course. So uh, the first thing is to describe balls in C with respect to this metric. We shall denote uh, for a point or a point Z0 in C and R positive, we shall denote uh, the ball of radius R. around Z naught to be D Z naught R. So recall that D Z naught R is the set of all Z in C such that the distance of Z to Z naught is less than R. So the D here is actually for disk. So balls in C are also called disks. That's the reason why we have used the word D for uh, the balls. If we are to work with a general metric space, which we will do sometimes in this lecture itself, we will use the word B instead of capital B instead of capital D. It should mean the same thing. Okay, let's now define or recall the definition of what is the meaning of a set being open in a given topological space. So, a uh, subset D contained in C is said to be open if for every Z in D there exists some positive number R, real number R such that the ball of the disk of radius R around Z is contained in D. This is another way of saying that Z is an interior point. So if every point in D is an interior point, if we can find some disk of radius uh, R around the point Z which is sitting inside D, then we say that D is an open set. And as a complementary notion, we will also be able to define what a closed set is, uh, a subset F contained in C is said to be closed if C, the complement of F, C minus F is open in C. So there is an alternate way of uh, defining closed sets, namely as a subset which contains all its limit points. So let me recall what a limit point is. We say that a point x in C is a limit point of, this is the definition of limit point of a 
subset D contained in C if every neighborhood of the point contains a point of D other than X itself. If uh, for every epsilon positive D Z epsilon intersected with U contains a point other than Z. Oh, we started off with X, so maybe I should change it to Z. So a point is a point Z is a limit point if it says if it satisfies the condition that for every neighborhood, every disk of any radius, if you intersect it with D, I am using a different uh, notation here, it is not U, it is D, the subset, it is a limit point of uh, D if every neighborhood of Z intersects D at a point other than Z. In a metric space, this is also uh, the same as demanding that you have a sequence in D converging to Z where the sequence consists of points other than Z. And I will leave it as an exercise for you to check that a subset F contained in C is closed if and only if it contains all its limit points. I am leaving it as an exercise. These are notions which I am sure you would have seen. If not, it I will refer you to Rudin's book which contains most of these results. Okay, so that is the definition of uh, an open set and a closed set. The open sets satisfy certain properties, certain conditions, so some properties of open sets. The first one which I would like to highlight is that C and the empty set, both are open sets. C and the empty set which I am denoting by P, let me tell this once, the empty set are open subsets of C. Any finite intersection of open sets is again an open set. These are things which can be verified. The first condition is very easily verified. Uh, if D1 or maybe I should use omega, omega 1, omega 2 up to omega n, finitely many of them are open sets in C, then so is omega 1 union, uh, union say anyway that, up to omega n, intersection of omega 1 up to omega n is also an open set. All finite intersections of open sets is again an open set. Again, I will not prove this, it is an easy check, you should sit down and work it out if you have not seen it before. And finally, any arbitrary union of open sets will again be an open set. So, uh, if omega alpha, where alpha is indexed by some arbitrary set, is a collection of open sets, in C, then so is, then union of omega alpha is open in C. And because it is satisfying these conditions, we commonly say that this forms a topology on the complex plane. This, this is commonly referred, these, con these properties are commonly, uh, let me not say referred to, these conditions are what makes the collection of open sets in the complex plane as a topology on the complex plane. So, let me just rephrase it and say that the collection of all open sets on C form what is called as a topology on C. So, our goal would be to work with 
this particular topology. This topology meaning that the collection of open sets which are defined using this particular metric. Okay, I, I would also like to introduce a few extra, uh, not extra, few other notions which we will uh, encounter very frequently. The first one being that of uh, the interior and of the closure. So, let D be a subset, an arbitrary subset of C. We define the interior of D to be the union of all open sets in C which are contained in D. So, let me define it, let me write it down. The interior of D is the, let me just write it in notations, is defined as. So, sometimes also denoted with a circle on top, this is defined as the union over all omega such that omega is contained in D and omega is open in C. You look at the union over all such open sets which are contained in D, whatever we get is called the interior of D. And along the same, in a similar manner, we can talk about the closure of uh, a given set. So, let F, uh, again let D be, we define the closure of D to be the set and it is uh, uh, commonly denoted by putting a bar on top. D bar is defined to be the intersection of all F is that F is something which contains D and F is closed in C. So, here in this first case which I am now uh, underlining in green by the uh, observation which I made earlier, it is clear that it is going to be an open set because all arbitrary union of open sets is again going to be an open set. Using De Morgan's law, you can check that the same thing translates to saying that the intersection, arbitrary intersection of closed sets will again be a closed set. So, this D bar is now a closed set, the closure of D is a closed set. So, the interior is in some sense the biggest open set sitting inside our given set D and D bar, the closure of D is in some sense the smallest closed set which contains our given set D. Okay, another notion which uh, we will need is that of denseness. So, let uh, continuing the setup we were in, we considered a D which was contained in C, right. So, let uh, E be contained in D be such that the, uh, uh, let E be contained in D be a subset. We say that E is dense in D if the closure of E in D is D. So, I will be a bit careful when I say this. We are taking the closure of E in D. So, what does it mean to say that we are looking at the closure of E in D? In this context, in the complex plane, we can just say that it is going to be the closure of E in C intersected with D. But usually, uh, when you take a subset D of a metric space, we can borrow or restrict the metric to this uh, subset D. And with that restricted metric, D turns out to be a metric space. And we can talk about balls in D, we can talk about open sets and closed sets in D. Basically, we can talk about the topology on D. This closure of E is with respect to the topology in D which is obtained using the restricted metric. So, let me just say that, uh, let me just say that this is with respect to 
the collection of open and closed sets in B with metric obtained with metric on D obtained by restricting the metric on C to D. Okay. Okay, next is the notion of uh, a sequence converging, which I'll not spend too much time. It's just the same thing, a uh, sequence Zn in C in C is said to converge to Z if the sequence of real numbers Zn minus Z converges to zero as n goes to infinity, and a uh, function f from omega to c, where omega is some sub open subset of is said to be continuous. We actually don't need to impose the restriction of omega being open, but nevertheless, let me just put it that way. It's said to be continuous if f inverse of d is open in omega. The condition that omega is open in C is going to uh, help us not worry about whether it is open in omega or whether it is open in D, but nevertheless, let me put, put it this way. F inverse of D is open in omega whenever T is open in C. This is the same as saying that if there is a sequence Zn in omega which converges to Z in omega, then F of Zn converges to F of Z. Okay, these are the usual notions which you are familiar with. Let me not spend more time on that. Uh, let me just make an observation that uh, the addition operation on the field of complex numbers is a continuous operation. So this and the multiplication operation and the multiplication operation from C cross C to C are continuous. So this, what is the meaning of this being continuous? Here on C cross C, you look at open sets consisting of the uh, collection of, oh yeah, the topology generated by uh, all collections of the type U cross V. So maybe I'll not elaborate too much on this. Let me just leave it at this and say that these two operations are continuous. And this is the same as telling that limit n going to infinity of Zn plus Wn is equal to limit of Zn plus the limit of Wn, where Zn and Wn are sequences in the field of complex numbers. And this is again saying that Zn times Wn is the same as limit n going to infinity of Zn times limit of n going to infinity from time of Wn. So, uh, yeah, I didn't write that these two operations are continuous, but this is effectively telling us that these the uh, operation of addition and multiplication are continuous in the product topology. Yeah, this can be checked by considering the triangle inequality and the fact that the absolute value of Z times W is absolute value of Z times the absolute value of W. So, using that, this can be checked. Let us next notice or observe that uh, just like R2 with respect to the standard metric, C is also actually the balls are the same. So if you already have seen the fact that R2 is complete with respect to the, to the standard metric, what we are going to uh, check next is redundant. 
But nevertheless, let's check explicitly that our complex plane is complete with respect to this particular net. But before that, uh, maybe I should also notice, uh, note one more thing, limit of n going to infinity of z bar, z n bar, this is going to be equal to limit n going to infinity z n bar. The conjugate, the limit of a sequence of conjugates is going to be the conjugate of the limit. This is basically telling us that the operation of conjugation is a continuous operation and this follows from, let me just say that this is because the absolute value of z bar is the same as the absolute value of z. Yeah. Okay, now let's take the next uh, st first steps in showing that uh, C is complete. We'll just use the fact that R is complete to establish that C is also complete. And in order to do that, what would, what would be the first step? The first step would be to observe that if Z is equal to A plus IB, recall that the absolute value of Z is just uh, A square plus B square to the power 1 by 2. And this is uh, going to manifest in the following inequality, mod A, in fact mod A and mod B. So let me just write mod A and mod B, both are less than or equal to A square plus B square to the power 1 by 2, which is less than or equal to mod of A plus mod of B. The first one, well, these are straightforward inequalities, let me not spend too much time behind this. This basically tells us that the absolute value of real part of Zn and the absolute value of the imaginary part of Zn is less than or equal to the absolute value of Z. Notice that the left hand side actually consists of uh, real numbers, Z is a complex number, again right hand side tells us that this is less than the absolute value of Zn plus the absolute value of the absolute value of the real part of Zn and the uh, added to the absolute value of the imaginary part of Zn. Okay, what does this, uh, what does this manifest as? Where is the n coming from? n is only going to come. I am writing it before it is coming into the story. Yeah, so these are the inequalities. We can talk about uh, complex number Z. Because of these inequalities, if uh, Zn is a sequence of complex numbers which converges to Z, then we immediately have that real part of Zn converges to the real part of Z. And we also have, so this is an, this is an implication we have. We also have one more implication which is basically the imaginary part of Zn converges to the imaginary part of Z. This is coming from this inequality. And this inequality tells us that if real part of Zn and imaginary part of Zn simultaneously converge to real part of Z and imaginary part of Z, then Zn converges to Z. So if Z in C be such that real part of Zn converges to real part of Z, and simultaneously the imaginary part of Zn converges to the imaginary part of Z, then Zn converges to Z. I'll just write it down as just a corollary for you to finally verify that this tells us that the field of complex numbers is complete. C is complete with respect to the metric defined above. We have to crucially use the fact that R is complete. So if Zn is a Cauchy sequence, so what does it mean to say that a metric space is complete? It uh, manifests in say, uh, proving that if you take, hold, uh, take any Cauchy sequence, then we have a limit. And that's precisely what we will be doing. If Zn is a Cauchy sequence, then the above observations tell us that the real numbers 
real part of Zn and the real numbers imaginary part of Zn both are Cauchy. And this uh, the, the completeness of R tells us that hence there exists A comma B such that real part of Zn converges to A and imaginary part of Zn converges to B. Let Z be equal to A plus Yi. Then the above observation tells again that N Zn converges to Z. Hence, every Cauchy sequence has a limit. Therefore, C is complete. So it was actually a straightforward observation using the fact that R is complete. Let us next discuss the notion of connectedness. Connectedness is a very crucial uh, idea or notion which we should be familiar with because uh, we will be mostly interested in working on connected open sets and C. So, understanding connectedness is crucial. Let's, let's do a recap of the notion of connectedness on C. So, what is the definition of <clears throat> a metric space? So, we will do one thing. In this uh, section, in, in, in the uh, definitions involving connectedness, we will work on general metric spaces rather than working just on C. Okay, so let x comma d be a metric space. We will talk about connectedness on metric spaces and then we will give a characterization of what is the meaning of connectedness in the setting of the complex plane. So, we will come to that in a systematic manner. To talk about connectedness in a metric space, we will first have to define what is meant by a separation of uh, a metric space. So, we define or we say that um, the metric space X, so I will do this abuse of notation from now, the metric space X. So when I say metric space X, there is an underlying distance function involved or the metric involved which I will suppress but there is always that metric at the back. We say that a metric space is separated if there exists disjoint non-empty open subsets of X. such that x is equal to, okay, subsets, let us give it some name, u comma v, u and v of x such that x is equal to u union v. You can get hold of uh, two open sets which are disjoint which are non-empty and you know open subsets which gives us the entire uh, metric space when we look at the union and then that is called a separation. So for example, uh, if you look at the complex plane, let us consider a ball of the uh, ball of radius 1 around uh, 0 and maybe a ball of radius 1 around say the point 4. Okay, so for example, x be equal to d 0 1 union d 0 d 4 1 in C and let us use the metric on C to restrict it to x and define a metric on x then u is equal to d 0 1 and v is equal to d 4 1 is a separation. In fact, I would say this, if we had taken uh, x to be the closed disks d01 bar and d41 bar and look at x, a new metric space x prime to be say d01 bar union d41 bar, then again u equal to d01 bar is an open set in x 
and V equal to D41 bar is an open set in X and the union will give us X. So that's something which you should notice. Let me give that as an example. Let X prime now be equal to D01 bar. So I'm putting this as a closure in C, but you should check that this is exactly the same as the set of all Z such that mod Z is less than or equal to one. This union D41 bar. This is the set of all Z such that mod Z minus four is absolute value of Z minus four is less than one. So basically this is uh, in this picture when considered x we were not looking at the boundary which is here the unit circle and the circle of uh, radius 1 around 4. These were not considered when we considered x but when we are considering x prime that set is also part of it and uh, you should sit down and check that with the metric borrowed from C D01 bar is open in X prime and D41 bar is open in X prime. So these are not open sets in C, but these are open sets in X prime in the subspace topology. And further, this, are, this is a separation of X prime. So both X and X prime are examples here of uh, metric spaces which are not connected. Oh, I didn't define connected. So let me define what connected is. We say that a uh, metric space is connected if there does not exist a separation of x. So there is absolutely no separation that you can find of x. If that is the situation, we then say that our metric space is connected. There is an alternate way of saying this, x is connected, there is a, let me reformulate it, x is connected if and only if x does not contain a proper subset, proper subset meaning the that it is non-empty and its complement is also non-empty, a proper subset of x which is both open and closed and simultaneously in x. So that is why this particular, these two examples are good to uh, highlight that. Notice that this is not a closed set D01, the disk of radius 1 around 0, that is not a closed set in C. However, in this set x, this is going to be closed because its complement which is D41 is an open set. So, you have to first check that both D01 and D41 are open sets in X as well and then the next observation would be that the complement of D01 is exactly equal to D41 which is an open set and by the very definition if the complement is open our given set is closed. So, D01 is closed in X even though it is not closed in C. Similarly, <coughs> Similarly, in X prime, D01 bar is open, even though it is not open in C, in the uh, metric space X prime, this is a, an open set. So, you can actually sit down and check that if something is both closed and open and it is a proper subset of X, then it gives us a separation of our given metric space. So, this is just rephrasing whatever we have just written above. Okay, so from your course on real analysis, you would have seen that the connected sets in the real line with respect to the standard metric, uh, it, they are just intervals. So, a subset x contained in R, so I am again suppressing the metric, it is the standard metric, 
is connected if and only if x is an interval. If you have not seen a proof of this, uh, I'll refer you to principles of mathematical analysis by Rudin. The proof is there in the second chapter, you can have a look. These are things which I am assuming because it's a part of our first course on real analysis and we will be assuming a course on real analysis while we do this course. So here we have given a characterization of how the connected sets in R behave. We will not be able to give this kind of a characterization on the complex plane. However, we will we'll give an alternate description of how connected open sets in C will look like or how they will behave. Uh, before that, let me just prove a proposition for you. The proposition tells us how connectedness is uh, behaving under continuous maps. So let f from x to y be a continuous function between metric spaces. Then f of x, the image of x is connected if x is connected. So continuous functions preserve connectedness, the notion of connectedness. The proof is actually quite straightforward. Proof is by contradiction. Suppose, so let z be equal to f of x. Okay, so when we say that f of x is connected, we are going to say that z is connected. What we mean is that z, remember, is sitting inside y. We will be borrowing the, uh, the metric from y rest by restricting it to z and then treat z with the restricted metric as a metric space. When we say that z is a connected metric space, we basically mean that z with the restricted metric is a, a connected metric space. Okay, let's prove it by contradiction. Suppose z is not connected. That means there is a separation of x. Then let z be equal to a union b, where a and b are open sets in x. in z, a and b are non-empty, and a intersected with b is empty. So, this, this is the definition of a separation. Okay, I'll just uh, claim, make a claim here that f inverse of a and f inverse of b are open in capital X and not elaborate on it, just observe that this follows since A is uh, U intersected with Z for U open in Y and F inverse of U is the same as F inverse of A and because F is a continuous mapping from X to Y, it will be a continuous mapping from X to Z. This is the, this is the uh, broad idea in, in establishing this particular claim, but let me not go deeper into it. I'll sit, allow you to sit down and write down the details. So if we do accede that f inverse of a and f inverse of b are open in x, we also know that a and b are non-empty and f is surjective onto z using the fact that a and b both are non-empty and f is surjective and a comma b are non-empty this together tells us that f inverse of a a and f inverse of b are non-empty so we now have non-empty open sets also since a union B is equal to Z and F is surjective onto Z, F inverse of uh, A union F inverse of B is equal to X.
The only thing to finally check is that these are disjoint, which you should sit down and check. This follows directly because A and B are disjoint. So, if we start off with a separation A comma B uh, of Z, then we end up with a separation of X. But we started off with X, which is connected. This is the assumption in the hypothesis, right? So this is a contradiction. So, also let me just note this. And hence, X is not connected. There is a separation, which is a contradiction. So that means our assumption to begin with was false. The assumption that there is a separation of Z. Hence, that does not exist in any separation of Z and therefore, Z is connected. That is what we had set out to do, right? Okay. Let me now define what is meant by path in a metric space. A path from a point x to y uh, in a metric space is just a continuous map from closed interval 0, 1 into the metric space x such that f of 0 is x and f of 1 is y. So, let me define that a path in a metric space from a point x in capital X to y in capital Y is a continuous mapping gamma from closed 0, 1 into x such that f of 0 is x and f of 1 is y. Not f, gamma. Gamma of 0 is x and gamma of 1 is equal to y. So, geometrically, let us try to draw some paths in, in the complex plane. Suppose we have the unit disk. You look at say gamma of uh, t to be equal to delta times, so let us call this z, t times z from 0, 1 to c. This is going to be a path which starts at 0 and which ends at z. So, this is exactly the straight line which is being captured here. Well, I am uh, sure you can sit down and uh, construct very complicated paths by uh, looking at various continuous mappings from 0, 1 into x, but uh, my intention here is to put your focus on the following aspect. Suppose you have a path from say z to w. Let us say there is a path like this from z to w and let us call this say gamma 1 and suppose there is a path now from z to say zeta and let us call this gamma 2 and if you traverse around or along gamma 1 till w and then along gamma 2 till zeta then effectively we will be getting hold of a path from z to zeta, isn't it? Even though I just said something which is sounding heuristic, it can be made precise and this is what is commonly captured by concatenating two paths. So, if sigma of s is defined as, okay, the context should be written down first, let gamma 1 be a path from x to y and gamma 2 be a path from y to say z in a metric space capital X. Let us define a new path gamma 1 dot gamma 2 or maybe 
let's just call it something as sigma of s to be equal to gamma 1 of 2 times s where s is going from 0 to half and in the second half that is what we were doing right in the first half it will go till w and in the second half it will go from w to zeta in the picture here it will be from x to y and then the second half will be 2s minus 1 where s is from half to 1 by using the pasting lemma or by brute force you can check that sigma is actually a continuous mapping from 0 1 into x then sigma is a continuous mapping from 0 1 to capital X and moreover sigma of 0 will turn out to be gamma 1 of 0 which is equal to X and sigma of 1 if you check it will be gamma 2 of 1 because S is now here and it will be 2 minus 1 so gamma 2 of 1 which is equal to Z. So we get hold of a path now from X to Z. Okay. Let us now give uh, an alternate characterization of how open connected sets are in C in terms of paths or uh, using the, the uh, notion of paths we, which we just defined. So let me write it down as a theorem. A subset, an open subset, omega contained in C is connected if and only if there exists a path for every pair of points, if and only for Z, W in omega there exists a path from z to w for any such pair of points z comma w we will be able to get hold of a path from z to w if omega is connected and if we can do that for every such pair of points then omega will be connected let us give a proof of this theorem Let us prove this direction first. If there exists a pair of points, uh, if there exists a path between any two pair of points, let us prove that omega is uh, connected. Again, the proof will go by contradiction like in the previous two cases. Suppose omega is not connected, is separated. We will get hold of a couple of points which cannot be connected by path or suppose we have uh, we will get hold of uh, yeah we will we'll arrive at a contradiction on the on the uh, on on something we will see what the contradiction is going to be suppose it is uh, separated then we can write omega as being equal to let us say u union v suppose you can write it as u union v where u and v are both open in omega. Notice that omega is an open subset of C, so we do not have to worry about whether it is open in omega or whether it is open in C. But anyway, uh, let us pick two points Z and W where Z is in U and W is in V. Okay? Let Z um, be a point in U because it is not empty, there certainly exists one such point and W in capital V. So, let us take two such points Z and W. If we can get hold of a path, we will show that there does not exist a path from Z to W. And that is the contradiction we will be showing. If there exists a path gamma from Z to W, then gamma is a continuous map from 0, 1 to x such that gamma of 0 is z and gamma of 1 is equal to w. Then what we will do is, I will 
just write the following and leave it at that then 0 1 is equal to f inverse of u union f inverse of it's not f right it's gamma gamma inverse of u union gamma inverse of v and because uh, u and v are open gamma inverse of u will be open in 0 1 it's a continuous map gamma inverse of v will be open in 0 1 again 0 belongs to this 1 belongs to this and they will be disjoint because u and v are disjoint to begin with. So, what is this? This is giving us a separation of 0 1. And we know that intervals are precisely the connected subsets of R. There does not exist a separation of 0 1 which is a contradiction. This basically is a contradiction. And therefore, hence there does not exist a separation of omega which is the same as saying that omega is connected. So, one side was quite easy, the backward direction was quite easy. We will prove that if it is connected, if omega is connected, we will prove that between any two points there always exists a path. Okay, so let us assume now that omega is connected. Let us fix some point z0 in omega, fix a point z0 in omega and let us capture uh, in the set A, A is defined to be all those elements in omega which can be connected by a path to z0. Let z be this will let this be the collection of all those points z in omega such that there exists a path from z0 to omega to z. We will prove that this particular set A is both open and closed in omega. Let us first prove that it is uh, open. So, the first claim is that A is open. Both the proofs actually are similar. So, let us first prove that it prove that it is open. Let uh, z0 be some, okay, z0 is already taken. Let z be some point in capital A. We will show that uh, a is, z is an interior point of A. Okay, so to do that, remember that omega to begin with was an open set. Since omega is open, there exists some r such that dzr is contained in omega. This much we can certainly say. The fact that z belongs to A tells us that there exists a path from z0 to z. Now, since A, uh, since z belongs to A, there exists a, what was A? A was the collection of all those points which had a path from z0. This is our A, right? There exists a path from z0 to z. Since z is in A, there exists a path gamma from z0 to z. If you look at the disk of radius r around uh, z in the complex plane, that is contained in omega because omega is an open set. We certainly have one such r, right? Now, for any point in in for any w. For any w in dzr, consider this particular path, consider the path, uh, what do we call it, sigma or maybe gamma prime, gamma prime is not a good one, gamma 1 from 0, 1 to uh, in fact omega given by gamma of s is equal to it is a path which I want to start from z and which ends at w. So, it will be 1 minus s times w plus s times
at 0 this should be z so this is going to be 1 minus s times z plus s times w and check that this is a straight line path which connects z to w and therefore it is contained in dzr so this hence is into c that is certainly true right gamma 1 and by the previous observation define sigma to be equal to gamma dot gamma 1 or in the similar uh, manner we defined earlier this is gamma of 2s if s is in 0 half and gamma 1 of 2s minus 1 if s is from half to 1 and this path sigma, sigma of s is a path from z0 to w, isn't it? And this tells us that w belongs to capital A because A was the collection of all those points which had a path from z0 to that particular point, right? And the uh, point W was arbitrarily picked in the disk of uh, radius R around Z. So, this gives us that DZR is contained in A. And our choice of Z was arbitrary, which hence tells us that A is open because this is the very definition of a set being open. So, we have established this particular claim, which tells that our set A is an open set. A very similar argument will tell us that A is closed as well. A is closed. To show that A is closed, we will show that omega minus A is open. So, let uh, again Z be in omega minus A because it is uh, and since omega is open, we can get hold of we have z we have r greater than 0 such that d z r is contained in omega if there exists if the if d z r intersected with capital a is not empty suppose this is uh, a non empty set then there exists w in the intersection and I just say that by a very similar argument above, we will be able to get hold of a path from z0 to z through w and that would give a contradiction to the fact that z or claim assumption that z is not in A. This would give a path, just fill in the details. We have already done that, give a path from z to z0 to z contradicting our assumption that z is not in z is in omega minus a and therefore there does not so the assumption has to be wrong hence this assumption has to be wrong. Yeah, I was looking for where the assumption is written. This assumption has to be wrong. Hence, dzr intersected with A is empty. But that implies that implies that omega minus A is closed. Oh, sorry, omega minus A is open because every point in omega minus A is now an interior point. And this implies that A is closed. We have now Come to the alternate uh, characterization which we have just written here. We have now got hold of a set which is both open and closed. So, uh, this cannot happen, but we have not uh, again this, this tells us hence A is both open and closed. So, hence A cannot be proper. Therefore, either therefore either A is equal to omega or A is empty. 
one of the two conditions is forced but a cannot be empty because z0 already belongs to uh, a since z0 belongs to a a is not empty which implies that a is equal to omega and that is precisely telling that every point in omega can be connected to z0 by a path. But again by a very similar argument of concatenating paths any two points can be connected now by a path through z0. Thus by uh, let me not elaborate a any pair of points in A can be connected by a path. Therefore, we have now a characterization of connected open sets. Remember that we have used uh, the fact that omega is open when we proved uh, the, the which was the direction, the forward direction. We first proved the backward direction and then we proved this uh, forward direction. In the forward direction, we have indeed used the fact that omega is open in the proof. So, we have now a, a characterization of connected open sets in the complex plane as being those open sets such that any two points can be connected by a path. Okay, let me not uh, go uh, more into the notion of connectedness. We will develop uh, any notion of connectedness which is needed and which you might not be familiar with whenever it comes as and when it comes.